Um, yeah, so just to, uh, to give you a, a summary of what Benefaction Foundation does, uh, we are a public foundation, so we're actually a charity registered with the Canada Revenue Agency. And our mandate is to work with affluent Canadians and their advisors to help them to harness strategic giving and integrate strategies for gift planning into their overall wealth management plan. So um, for us, that means that all of the revenue for the foundation is really a direct result of a uh, influence from an estate planner or an investment advisor or portfolio manager who's helping a client with a plan. So we understand the value of building those relationships and providing added value uh, to those individuals. Um, and probably the reason why we were asked to come here and talk to you today as well. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, my agenda today is to cover some basic slides on uh, charitable giving trends in Canada. And then we'll cover a couple of sections on challenges to your wealth and also uh, we'll have a discussion about whether taxes are voluntary or involuntary. And um, then I'll give some case studies or examples of gifts that we've uh, helped with or kinds of gifts rather that we've helped with. And we'll end with a, a summary of the differences between uh, private foundations and donor advised funds being a, a relatively new but increasingly popular vehicle for giving in Canada and what Benefaction really does specialize in. So let's start with charitable giving trends. Um, there are over 86,000 registered charities in Canada and that number keeps going up every year. So there are a lot and um, when you register as a charity, you have to register uh, with a specific charitable object or objective. Uh, and there are four key ones. Uh, the first is relief of poverty, um, relief of uh, the advancement, sorry, of education. Um, and the other two are a benefit to the community and religion. Being, being the advancement of religion being the fourth. So all charities have to be registered in one of those categories. And that pie chart shows you the split of the Canadian charities now and how they, how they break down. In terms of the full 86,000, 88% 80, uh, of those are charities, the organizations that are doing good work out there, the, the food banks and the shelters and things like that. 12% are foundations. And that 12% is split 50-50 uh, between private foundations and public foundations. Interestingly, you know, as the numbers keep going up, the Canada Revenue Agency Charities Directorate get many applications, over 4,000 last recorded in a given year for new charitable organizations. But interestingly, they are increasingly diligent um, with their compliance and holding charities accountable in terms of um, making sure that they are adhering to all the rules and their methods of reporting. And so there are also a number of revocations that happen on an annual basis, and last report was 1,800. So while there are a lot of charities that are starting out, Canada Revenue Agency are becoming increasingly diligent in making sure that all of those organizations are, are doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is a good thing. So. This slide, as you can see, um, it, it is a representation of reported donations. And so, as you can see, there's been a lot of growth in, in donations that have been reported on the tax returns of Canadians over the years. In fact, um, and, and relative to the average family income as well, it's, it's quite significant. In fact, it's really been a, a golden age for the philanthropy world in Canada. Um, we are now back to pre-2008 uh, figures, we topped 8.6 in 2013. That's $8.6 billion in reported donations from Canadians. So um, we've seen significant growth, almost 150% between 1995 and, and 2013. So lots of, uh, lots of growth, which is great news because Canadians in general are giving more. 
However, there are some troubling trends as well. It's, it's not all uh, great news. While the total number of donations are growing, um, in, there are fewer individuals that are giving each year, and that number is trending downwards. So that is uh, a concern, um, but nonetheless, I think that the growth trends in donations will, will continue, and the reason that I believe that that's true is just demographics. Um, the people in the age 65 plus category have a very strong correlation with giving. Um, People in the last three bars there, uh, everyone over 45, basically the baby boomer generation, are giving 75% of donations in Canada today. And right now we've got over 4 million people in that age category in Canada. By 2026, we're going to have over eight. That population is going to double. So I believe that based on demographic, legislative, and societal trends, we will continue to see that, that growth in donations in Canada. And this is the last slide on the, on the sector. It's just interesting to see how the negative effect that a recession and major market turmoil can have on people's inclination to give. Obviously, you know, um, people become more conservative during those times, which makes, makes sense. So the next section we're going to discuss is um, what are some of the challenges to, to your wealth and the challenges to the, certainly the people that we work with um, who are wealthy and are trying to establish a gift plan. An advisor friend of mine uses a, a, an analogy and a number of these slides are, are from him. He describes uh, one of the biggest challenges to your wealth um, in light, in, in a traf, by giving a traffic light analogy, really, where uh, with different asset types in each, the green, yellow, and red categories. And he's really talking about ultimately the tax on those asset strategies and how they affect um, those different asset categories. So the first category is the uh, green assets where nothing is taxed and there's no tax at all on those on those assets. So the primary example of this would be, of course, your principal residence. When you sell your home, you don't have to pay any, any capital gains tax on that. And the second asset category, uh, the yellow asset category, are taxed at 50%. So 50% um, of the gain is taxed from the first dollar in those cases. So they would be uh, investments like appreciated securities, real estate, and shares in your private business, for example. And the third asset category is the red asset category. Here, 100% of the assets are taxed from the first dollar. So that would include things like interest income, RSPs, and RIFs. So suffice it to say that RIFs um, and RSPs are really one of the worst ways to transfer dollars to your beneficiaries. And this is one of the things that um, will come full circle on this later on when I show you some gift examples. Um, one of the things that can be addressed through a good gift plan. Another uh, particularly challenging thing to the wealth of Canadians is um, important from a business owner's perspective. There are many business owners in Canada and much of the wealth that is generated is a result of private business. So how many of those private businesses that are established in Canada, in Canada do you think survive? Any guesses? 5%. 5%? Well, that's close. In the first generation, one in three will survive. And in the second generation, one in eight. And in the third, three in 100. So 70% of Canadian families are failing to preserve their wealth from one generation to the next. This is another main concern of the, the people that we're working with and, and they want to try and find a way to do that. Another big concern, particularly um, about transferring assets to heirs, is will my money hurt my heirs? 
Um, you see a number of people, particularly extremely high net worth people, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates being a prime example, where they've decided publicly to limit the, num uh, the assets that they will leave to their children and they will donate the rest to charity. Um, and it's exactly because of this kind of concern and challenge and sentiment that they, um, they do that. But it's more and more common these days. And on that note, in the uh, famous gentleman here, Warren Buffett, he said uh, a, an important quote on that note. He said, parents should leave children enough money so that they could feel they could do anything. Oops, sorry. But not so much that they could do nothing. And I think that's, that's really a, a common sentiment um, that uh, the, the ultra-wealthy are, are having with, uh, in terms of grappling with how to, how to transfer that wealth. So let's move on and talk about the concept of whether or not taxes are indeed voluntary. <coughs> You've heard that saying, right, that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. And here in Canada, of course, when we die, um, there is, uh, your assets are all deemed to have been disposed. So there's an immediate tax hit really on you um, if you have not done any, any planning in advance. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So where ultimately do you wish um, your money will go when you pass on? I mean, the question, um, the answer to that for most people is going to be to my loved ones. I want to make sure that I'm maximizing the money uh, that go to my loved ones. The reality, however, is different. Because of that deemed disposition, the, the revenue agency are really first in line when um, when we die, particularly if we haven't established a plan. Second uh, would be our, our heirs and our loved ones and our family. And then only third would be our charities of choice. So charities really stand at the end of the line in terms of, of, of uh, you know, the priorities and ranking there. And we research tells us that when asking people, you know, what are the most important priorities in terms of your wealth, and certainly their heirs are, are definitely number one, their ability to, um, you know, make sure they can get through retirement and income, education, and gifts to charity really are uh, at the end of that category. And that's understandable, but the question that I have um, is what if this could be the scenario? What if you were able to turn that around and make sure that your loved ones were taken care of first <coughs> and foremost, your charity next, so that you could leave a significant gift and put the Canada Revenue Agency at the end of that line? Would you be interested in, in doing that? Or how about this scenario, where in fact you were able to change the, change the uh, the, the course of, of events and, and leave very little, if maybe even nothing, um, that would go to taxes at the end. It's really a question that you need to ask yourself is, you know, is, is this really your wealth? Is this what it's about? Is it really just about the money? You know, your wealth is more than money. This is what it is for me, these are pictures of my family and vacations and things that I like to do and the important thing for people is going to be different in all cases. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that wealth has more than one dimension. It's not just financial. There's also a huge personal aspect to it and a social aspect to it as well. And um, being able to control part of that social aspect is, is kind of the point where we're talking about today. If wealth planning only focuses on the financial dimension, then it's really nothing more than a decision that you make uh, you know, every year or so when uh, having discussions with your advisors. But maybe it could be a lot more than that. And it's really a question of asking yourself what's important to you in those three dimensional factors about having money. And if you had more, what would you do with that money, and, and where would you direct it from a charitable perspective? Um, because if you don't, you might end up being that involuntary philanthropist. And that person who hasn't got a plan in place, what's going to happen is this is the way their social capital 
or, or money will be spent. This is just a picture of what the Canada Revenue Agency does with, its, with our tax dollars. Not trying to cast any aspersions about what the government is doing with our money, but most people when uh, asked and having a look uh, at that slide, um, when, when they are asked, would they donate their money this way, most people would say no, and they would choose different categories to uh, place their charitable assets or their social assets. So you can pass family wealth on to beneficiaries without paying any taxes. Uh, it is possible. You can sell your appreciated assets and pay no capital gains tax. You can avoid paying capital gains tax and the CRA will give you an additional tax deduction or Credit. Finally, you can support the causes you care about without reducing lifestyle or beneficiaries' inheritances if you do some, uh, some appropriate planning with your financial advisors. So we're going to move on to um, give you some examples of some of those gift strategies, the kinds of things that we have been involved uh, with at Benefaction Foundation. Uh, but first, we'll talk about um, some of the basics. This is uh, the Family Legacy Pyramid. It's um, a slide that I've seen in various guises, been around for many years, I think developed first by the Legacy Group from the US. And they talked about um, financial, the hierarchy of financial priorities, and the, the foundation of which, of course, is your personal financial needs. And do you have enough money to continue throughout your lifetime? Do you have enough money um, to cover all of your expenses through retirement and have enough in, in the event of an emergency set aside as well? And then the second layer of that uh, is your family legacy. Do you have enough money to pass on to your heirs? And will that be done from an estate planning perspective in a tax efficient manner? Um, and then once you have, you, put that kind of a plan in place. Anything that's left over is really the social capital. If you don't have a plan in place, that social capital will be going to the Canada Revenue Agency. But what if you could be the custodian of that social capital and direct those funds yourself to the organizations that you value most? That's really what we're trying to, to focus on here. This slide represents the same concept in, in a different way. The red line shows your lifestyle line. That's your, the amount of funds that you'll need um, over time to, uh, to get through your life. And then ultimately, the surplus wealth is what your social capital is. So once you can establish what that number is, and financial planners and advisors are able to help you, and they have their algorithms and, and software to be able to do that, and then that will give you a pretty good picture of what, what kind of number that social capital really is. But let's uh, get back to basics for just a few minutes and talk about charitable gifts and taxes. Um, all donations in Canada, over $200, are entitled to receive a tax credit at, uh, at the individual's highest marginal tax rate, so your federal plus provincial tax rate. But there are limits. Uh, to that, and the donation limit is 75% of your income in a given year. Uh, however, the good news is you can carry forward an, the amount uh, if it is in excess of 75%, uh, and you can carry it forward for five years. So a, a large gift, you could still start to write that off, or from a tax credit perspective, I should say, take advantage of that uh, for a six-year window, the year of the gift plus an additional five years. Receipts are always to be based on fair market value. Beware of receipts that are um, issued in excess of fair market value of the gift. Donated securities uh, that you do not pay since 2007, you will not pay a capital gains tax on securities that are donated in kind. Um, will donations, the 75% limit changes to 100% in the year of your death and you can carry that back one year as well um, when your final tax return is submitted. So those are the basics. 
Um, now I'm going to take you through a few uh, examples, as I said. So the most basic one is the gift of publicly listed securities. So in this case, the donor is giving shares of appreciated securities to charity and paying no capital gains tax. The charity determines the fair market value of the gift, and then they are going to uh, issue a tax receipt based on that fair market value to the donor. And the donor is then going to take that donation receipt and use it to apply for tax credit on their, get, on their uh, next tax return. So there's a double benefit there. They're getting the tax receipt for the fair market value of the gift to apply for a credit, plus they're not going to pay any capital gains tax, which they would have otherwise had to do prior to 2007. So definitely worth looking at your appreciated securities to make donations instead of making those donations in cash because it's more tax effective for you to do so. For executives, executives are extremely busy people. Um, they, and often, they've accumulated a significant portfolio in, the single, in a single stock, the stock of the company that, that they work in, um, and also are compensated often in stock options. Uh, but they're community-minded people too, but they often don't have um, uh, or, they're, or not necessarily well informed about some of the tax, tax aspects of charitable giving. So um, one good strategy for executives is to donate cash proceeds from those stock options. As long as the proceeds are received within 30 days of the exercise date, no capital gains tax will be payable on that donation. So very effective strategy for people who are executives. Um, and often also used uh, in combination with the strategy to use other cash on hand to buy back those securities if they still feel that they, they want to hold those securities and adjust their cost base of their portfolio as well. Um, a gift of RRSP, this example is about a wealth replacement strategy and addresses the, uh, the RRSPs being one of the worst ways to transfer assets for, for a lot of people, assuming that they have a charitable intent. Um, so in this example, we have a donor who is making a gift of a registered uh, plan by naming the charity the beneficiary of that plan. It's important that registered plan holders that you filled out the appropriate beneficial uh, beneficiary change forms because um, often uh, I've heard stories that um, that can cause problems if the right forms haven't been filled out in advance. However, the second part of this strategy is to then uh, the donor would take out an insurance policy relatively for the for more or less the same value of the RRSP. On their death, the charity is going to issue a tax receipt for the donor based on the value of the RSP. And the heirs are going to receive the cash proceeds from the insurance policy, which will not go through probate. Effectively, what's happened in the strategy is that the donors have brought their wealth for their heirs back to the pre-tax level of uh, the donation, and they've made a donation at the same time. So it's a very effective strategy and has been used in a number of cases. Gifts of new life insurance policies. We're doing a, increasingly a number of gifts of new life insurance policies. In this case, when you, uh, what's being donated really is the premium. The donor has to be insurable, of course, and the charity becomes both the owner and beneficiary of the policy. Um, and then the donor donates on an annual basis premiums to pay for that policy. When they pass on, they've left a considerable gift to charity. And in the meantime, they're benefiting from the donation receipts that they're getting throughout uh, the premium payment period. The last two examples that I have to share with you are really focused on uh, business, business owners, uh, donations through companies, uh, and one really good one um, which is specific to uh, holding companies. Um, so if you have a holding company where the, the donors or the clients have got um, an investment portfolio in that holding company as well as a reasonable amount of cash on hand, then this strategy works extremely well. 
In this case, the hold co is giving the shares to charity. And just like with individuals, the charity is going to issue a tax receipt to the hold co for fair market value. The hold co can use that tax receipt for a deduction, not a, um, not a credit, um, but nonetheless, same effect from a tax perspective. And the second step in, in this strategy is that the capital gain attributed to those donated shares is allocated to something called the capital dividend account, which is a notional account on the books and records of companies and ultimately uh, is used to track capital gains and losses. And from there, uh, the, the Hold Co. is able to pay out tax-free dividends to the shareholders. So there are lots of benefits to a company, uh, a company owner here. Um, they are going to receive the tax receipt for the fair market value of the shares. They're not going to pay any capital gains on those shares, which they have otherwise would have had to pay. They're going to 100% uh, of the full capital gain amount can be allocated to the capital dividend account, and then that can be paid out to shareholders tax-free. So that's a very effective strategy for business owners. Another effective strategy for business owners is a, a gift of uh, private company shares, and in this case, preference shares. Um, there's lots of wealth in Canada created by private business owners, but sometimes it's without a full on sale, it's hard to extract the value of that wealth. Um, but this strategy is, is one good way to do it for business owners who are charitably inclined. Um, in this case, the donor is going to give uh, shares to charity. These are private company shares, and it's the shareholder who's making the donation. Um, that would require a recent valuation for the private company shares. And um, in our case, when we do this, we also need to ensure that we have um, an, someone to acquire the shares um, from the foundation. And we would then issue a tax receipt, of course, to the donor for the fair market value based on the valuation of those shares. The company then um, itself would issue a taxable deemed dividend to redeem those shares from the charity and the charity would give the shares back to the company and take the cash from the dividend. The company would then, having issued the dividend, be in a position to apply for a refund through the refund dividend tax on hand account. It's 33% and therefore get an additional credit back from the government. So um, not as effective of, as uh, completely eliminating your capital gain, but nonetheless very effective. Um, and a strategy that we've, we've helped uh, implement a number of times. So I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about what's new. Um, and we recently had a budget and there was some great news in the budget of 2015 in regard to donations. Because in addition to what is now uh, exempt capital gains for publicly listed securities, uh, soon, capital gains exemptions will be extended to uh, both gifts of private company shares and to real estate, and that will be commencing in 2017. So in this case, though, there are some differences. Unlike uh, transfers in kind of publicly listed securities, in this case, both of these asset types would have to be sold in advance and then donated to uh, an arm's length charity, arm's length from the donor, that is, within 30 days, similar to the stock of cash proceeds of stock options example we talked about earlier. Um, and, and importantly, the government were quite clear about this, it would have to be an arm's length uh, charity to, with both the donor and the, the donee. And in addition to that, yes. Still, there's no change there. You're still donating in kind. Right, which seems ridiculous. If you could just sell them and give cash to the charity, that would be a lot easier. Well, generally speaking, that's what the charity will do. That's what we do the following day after we value so them. We sell those securities. Sell them immediately. Right. So it would seem sensible. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, it, it, I don't disagree with you, but uh, there's been no change. Uh, there's been no change in that regard. Um, so, uh, nonetheless, these are really very welcome, welcome changes, and I think we will see. It'll be very interesting to see what happens over the course of the next few years, and, and how gifting will change um, from these major asset categories over time. So, the final section that I have to um, to cover. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There are a few anti-avoidance rules that will apply um, in, in when these, uh, when these uh, donations are made available to us. And they still have to go through you know, final approval in the courts and whatnot. But those, are, um, those rules will apply for five years subsequent to the gift. So if uh, the donor cannot reacquire the property that has been given within the five-year period. Um, in the case of shares, um, they can't acquire substitute shares for those uh, for what has been donated either or another form or share class or what have you. And um, also in the case of shares, the arm's length relationship between the donor and the organization that's received these securities uh, or the property, I should say, um, can't change. They have to remain at arm's length for that five-year period. So those are the anti-avoidance rules that have been put in place. So now we will go on to the uh, comparison that I've uh, got for you before private foundations versus um, donor-advised funds. And it's really about what's most appropriate for you, but um, we specialize in donor-advised funds, so we know, we know a little bit about those. Um, I guess the first question you need to ask yourself is, how do you want to give? Um, many people would prefer to give directly to the charity that they are working with. They know the money is going right to that charity at that time, and they don't want it sitting parked away somewhere else. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. And that is what many people do and will continue to do, I'm sure. But another thing to consider is giving of time and skills. If you're charitably inclined and you find yourself with more time, many charities in Canada are in dire need of assistance in terms of developing business acumen and, and just getting more volunteers. So giving of time and skills, you know, it's not all just about money. Um, charitable organizations do need, need our help. And so, you know, that's an important factor to consider. Setting up your own foundation, really the ultimate in terms of being able to establish a fund that over the long term will, will fund your charitable objectives and purposes and, and provide you with the most control, which we'll talk about in a little while. Or giving through a donor advised fund is another option and we'll, we'll also discuss that. It's an increasingly popular option, giving through uh, a, a fund that's set up at a public foundation as opposed to uh, setting up a private foundation of your own. So we'll, um, we'll go through a little bit about that. It's really about the tradition of endowment. Um, an endowment fund is, a long, uh, is a, an investment fund, and it's set up for the purposes of uh, in, to be invested for the uh, assets to ultimately go to charity. But most endowment funds have um, a no encroachment on capital rule, so only the uh, income and or, or growth capital in capital can be dispersed on an annual basis. But it's not to say that all endowments are like that. Some endowment funds do allow um, donors to encroach on capital so that you can gift out a, a considerably larger portion of the donation that uh, they've set up. A private foundations, they're generally established by virtue of an endowment fund that's coming from one family or one individual. And um, that family sets up a fund, sets up their own private foundation, and ultimately is, uh, has total control, therefore, over, over those assets. A donor-advised fund is very similar in that it is also a form of an endowment fund, but it's with a public foundation versus a private foundation. And there are some limitations and advantages of uh, that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but really, they're all different forms of endowment funds is the point I'm trying to make. 
Um, donor advised funds have been around for a long time. They're really the um, you know the the community foundation uh, foundations in North America were um, where they were born. Um, and in 1914, in fact, the first community foundation sprung up and. Since then, across the country in the U.S., there are you know, now, I think, close to 1,000 community foundations. We have many here in Canada as well. They set up donor-advised funds initially to fund specific projects in the community. And then larger institutions, the likes of Harvard being one of the first set up donor-advised fund programs as well. Uh, and then in the early 90s, the financial institutions got into the game of establishing donor advised fund programs, the first being Fidelity. Um, suffice it to say that right now, uh, donor advised funds are the fastest growing charitable giving vehicle in the US. Uh, they outnumber private foundations by two to one. And uh, so obviously donors are finding them to be um, useful, uh, flexible structures, charitable giving structures, and um, are voting with their feet and opening more. So I think that while we don't have exactly the same uh, information in Canada, um, I think that we'll continue to see growth in, in what we do as well. So the private foundation advantages uh, and limitations are, there are many advantages to setting up your own private foundation, but for me the most important one is control. If you set up a private foundation, you're making the main donation yourself. You control completely the assets, how they're invested. You also control completely where and when, uh, which charitable organizations will receive the donations from your foundation, uh, so the recipients. You can be publicly recognized. You can use your foundation as a way to instill altruistic values in your family, and it's a great tax planning tool. But you do have to administer it. You have to open either a, a corporation or a trust, and you have to have a board of directors, and you have to hold meetings and minute them. You're responsible for financial reporting. But you have to submit a tax return to the revenue, and you have to keep books and records uh, for those purposes. Another limitation sometimes with private foundations is continuity. A lot of individuals have set up private foundations, very passionate about their cause. When they pass on, their families or heirs or whomever is taking over are not always as passionate about that specific cause. Um, so it's important that the charitable objectives are sufficiently, uh, when, the, when the foundation is set up, are sufficiently flexible to allow for some change to be made and, and for that to be considered. Um, and in some cases there are also some reduced tax benefits when, sending, when making gifts, particularly private company shares, into uh, private foundations. But um, to compare uh, and contrast a little bit, I just thought I'd take a, a step back to define the donor advised fund. It is an endowment fund, as I've said. It's set up with a public charity. Um, it can receive funds from not just one family may, as a main source, but from many individuals. Uh, the donors are making an irrevocable gift. Usually that gift is cash or securities and some of the other things we've talked about today. And in exchange, the donors to those funds are assuming the role of advisor on the fund. And by that I mean they are ultimately the ones who are able to make recommendations to the foundation on who the grant recipients will be. In other words, which charities you want to receive the funds from uh, your donor advice fund. You get the tax receipt, you can name the fund whatever you want, the Nicola Elkins Family Foundation. Um, and you get to continue to work with your existing investment advisor, the advisor, if you wish to, the advisor who has helped you to build some of your wealth along the way. So you have an opportunity to do that. I really always say it's like having your own private foundation without having to uh, do a lot of the work and set up an administration of it. And it has a lot of the same advantages of, having a pro of setting up a private foundation. You can be directly involved, you can be publicly recognized, or remain anonymous. The anonymity thing is, is an important one, I think, too. Private foundations sometimes aren't always so private because all charities have to post the names of all directors on their website, uh, the CRA post it for us. Uh, on our website, uh, all the donations that are made, the total amount of donations made in in a given year, and each um, 
Each charity that has received a gift from that organization is also posted. So all of that information is public. Um, with a public foundation or a donor advised fund, we still have ex exactly the same reporting requirements, but it's done on an aggregate basis. So nothing would ever be attributable to an individual fund holder. So people who are specifically concerned about privacy have often chose the donor advised fund option, even if they have large sums. Uh, for that very reason. Um, but I guess from a limitations perspective, there's definitely a difference in terms of advisory rights and con versus con total control with the private foundation over the investment of assets and ultimately the disbursement of, of grants because in a public foundation, it's the board of directors of that foundation and not the individual donors who, who have the ultimate say on that. So those are, those are the differences. I like to say that it's uh, really three easy steps to set up a fund, gift, grow, and grant. Uh, the gift is after signing a donor agreement and making a donation, usually that's in the form of securities, the foundation will issue you with a tax receipt. The grow part is taking those assets and investing them with your investment advisor so that they grow tax-free over time. And the grant part is then taking your annual recommendations, and they don't have to be annual, they can be you know, monthly or quarterly or what have you, and grant making the grants out to the charities of your choice. So it's really pretty simple, and deciding between them, um, you really just have to ask yourself you know, some basic questions. I think that first and foremost, it would be, how much time are you prepared to put into establishing a foundation, managing it, running it? Um, and, and what have you. Time factor is, is a key one in terms of making a decision between one or the other. Um, what are the fees, the ongoing setup costs, uh, the ongoing costs and the setup costs uh, between one or the other and, and what's your tolerance to those fees? Um, is control a, a key issue for you specifically in terms of investments um, and in terms of uh, donation timing? Um, and um, you know those are really those are really the key things you need to be thinking about in, in trying to make a decision as to what might be most appropriate. So to um, to sum up, really, um, I mean, if you did want to get started and do a, a, a gift plan, then these are the things or the steps that that we recommend to really reflect on your personal values and. What is it that your strategic vision is? What's the cause that you care about most that you want to try to address? And then you need to determine the hows. What are the mechanics going to be? What am I going to give? And what method am I going to give through? Am I going to set up one of these funds? Am I going to give directly? How, how am I going to actually make my gift? And I recommend that you talk to your financial advisors to ensure that whatever you're doing is done in the most tax effective way as possible. We're very lucky here in Canada. We have a lot of incentives uh, to make donations uh, even more beneficial to us from a tax perspective. And uh, it's not unfair from a charitable perspective to take absolute advantage of all of those incentives. They're there for a reason and they're there to encourage us to give. So we should take advantage of those. And then ultimately monitoring and evaluating your gift. And finally, if you're interested, we have a gift plan workbook that will help you walk through some of the you know, softer stuff in terms of trying to identify your cause. So without further ado, that, that's it from me in terms of our discussion, or my discussion on charitable giving, but I'm happy to take any questions if you have them at this time.